Good, good morning. Good to see everybody. So glad you're here today. Uh, make you aware of a few announcements as we get started. There are several things going on as more and more activity ramps up at the church. Our bulletin is becoming more and more like a newsletter again. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen? Amen. Amen. A uh, couple of things. We are uh, offering a view of each deacon candidate each week so you can get to know them better. And you'll find a, a biography each week of a candidate we'll be highlighting. And then at the end of all this, we'll have a special election to elect new deacons uh, because we're down a few right now. Uh, but today, our deacon candidate is Chad Lofton. And, yeah, yeah. and he'll be offering the prayer uh, in a moment uh, at the deacon prayer time. But uh, there's a little biography about him, and we'll have three more candidates over the course of the next few weeks. Um, we're also still in the midst of our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Today is the last day uh, that you can pick up an offering envelope and give for Annie Armstrong. Our goal is 6000 We've collected 4080 to date. Uh, so continue to be in prayer about how you might give if you've not had the opportunity to do that. Also, Miss Cindy Carroll would like me to announce that we got more spots for the, uh, the Dakota trip uh, for the Young at Heart. You see that in there. Uh, we have 33 signed up. If we drop below the threshold of 30, if some people cancel, we won't be able to go. So we need a few more folks to go. And plus, we're going to have a fabulous time. So if you're interested uh, in going on our Young at Heart trip, uh, see Miss Cindy today, all right? Miss Cindy, wave at them. Wave at them. There she is, right there. All right. Um, we are also going to be having photographs at the church next week for you and your family. Uh, if you would like to have a photograph with all your kiddos for Mother's Day, or if your kiddos can't come and you'd like to have a photograph with your spouse, or if your spouse isn't very photogenic and you want to take a picture by yourself, uh, you can do so, and we're gonna we're gonna get you a free eight by ten glossy. Uh, but anyway, a, a photographer will be here, set up and ready to go to take your pictures. So that's a special treat uh, for you and your family, and an opportunity for you to get your kids to come to church and take a picture with you. Also. Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, I knew there was one more thing. Uh, we are having a regular church conference on Wednesday night after church uh, Bible study time. Regular church conference. Uh, just uh, nothing unexpected to vote on, but we'll, we'll be presenting some things and, and talking about just our regular activities, okay? So you be aware of that. It's at a strange time. That's why I need to announce it today, all right? Y'all ready to worship? Y'all are very quiet, so let's, let's hopefully, once y'all sing a little, you'll get woke up. Please stand.
God. All glory to your name. Thank you that you're not just our living hope. You're our only hope. Thank you that we can call on you in our joys, in our sorrows, in our triumphs, in our fears. Every moment is yours. And you cover every single one of them with your hope. All glory to your name. You're an everlasting hope. And we stand in the humbleness. And we are so grateful so grateful that we can never give you the full honor and glory that you deserve. Lord, allow us to continue to worship you in this moment, this day, this hour, and every step we take here forth. Thank you. All praise to your name. Amen. I did want to say welcome if you're our guest today. Uh, we'd like for you to let us know you're here. So if you would, on your way out today, stop by the Welcome Center across the hall, and we'll be glad to give you a gift thanking you for being here and uh, have you fill out a card so we know who you are. If you have any questions, just, uh, just indicate on that card you'd like to talk to someone, and we'll, we'll get with you. All right. Welcome. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Pastor Josh. All right, it is my personal favorite time of our service. It's the children's moment time, so if I can have all the kids come on up here and join me. While you're on your way up, how many of you like Vacation Bible School? Y'all do? Well, guess what? We're getting ready for Vacation Bible School this summer, but I need volunteers, and I need parents, people who are out in the pews right now, to sign up. And guess what? The sign-up sheets are right outside in the main entrance. So if you're interested in helping me with vac Vacation Bible School, I would love to have you sign up in one of the spots that are available right out on your left next to our welcome desk. What's so, do what? What's a pew? A pew. A pew. Oh, those are the seats that the people are sitting in. I thought she said pews, too. <laughs> the pews are the seats that, that are in the sanctuary that everybody's sitting in. It's an old word for it. All right. Well, how many of you have friends? I have friends. Yeah. Friends are awesome. And you know what? Friends are people that we can trust, hopefully. People that we can talk about our worst fears or some of our favorite moments. Did you know that the Bible tells us something about how to look for friends? It says in Proverbs 13, my mind, my mind just lost it, 20, says, walk with the wise and become wise and associate with the fools and get in trouble. That is the Bible telling us, whoops, <laughs> that is the Bible telling us that we've got to walk with people who walk with God. We've got to be smart about who we choose to be our friends. And it's also the Bible telling us when we make bad choices for friends, we can end up in a lot of trouble. So, when you're going to school, when you're spending time with people, make sure that they're acting the way God would want you to act. Because we can easily follow our friends. And sometimes, when we follow the wrong people, we end up making bad choices. But if we let God help us choose our friends, we're always going to make the right choice. All right, let's bow our heads and pray, and then we're going to go to Children's Church.
Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to have friends here on earth. But thank you also for the guidance, helping us choose friends who are leading us closer to you. And Lord, as we go into our children's church today, I pray that you will guide us, speak to each one of us in the room, and help us to become more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm Pastor Josh. Please stand with us and sing.
you chose to love us. You loved us so much that you sent your son to die on a cruel cross, Father, that if we would truly believe and allow him to be our Messiah, we can spend eternity with you. Lord, we're so thankful that we who know you can have hope that's eternal. Not hope that's fading, but hope that is everlasting, that is based on biblical scripture, Father. Lord, thank you so much for Jesus. We do worship his name because there is no name above the name of Jesus. 
Father, as we hear your word, I pray that our hearts would be attentive, our minds focused, so that we can tell this dying world who the Savior truly is, that Jesus Christ can make a difference in our life if we would admit, believe, and follow him. And Lord, through that, we can find the joy, the peace that passes all understanding. Thank you so much for first loving us and loving us so much to send your Son so that through him we can have salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Interestingly enough, in the first seven chapters of the letter of Paul to Rome, to the Roman church, the Holy Spirit is only mentioned one time in the first seven chapters. In chapter 8, he's mentioned around 20 times. The Holy Spirit is to the believer what the Father is to the physical world. The Holy Spirit is the divine agent that creates, sustains, and preserves our spiritual life. So let me say that again. Whereas the Father in His Word creates and preserves and sustains the physical world, the Holy Spirit, person of the Trinity, sustains creates life and sustains life and preserves life in the spiritual creature. The Holy Spirit is the one who will bring every believer into glory. The Holy Spirit is not an emanation from God. He is a divine person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is equal to God in every way. The Holy Spirit is God. Among the many characteristics of the personhood that the Holy Spirit possesses and manifests to us in this created world, he functions with the mind, emotion, and will of the believer. He loves the saints. He communicates with the saints. He teaches them and guides them and comforts them and chastises them and uplifts them. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, quenched, lied to, tested, resisted, and blasphemed. The Bible speaks of the omniscience of the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks, that's his all-knowing nature. The Bible speaks of his all-powerful nature, his omnipotence. The Bible speaks of his omnipresence, his everywhere presence. The Bible speaks of his divine glory and of his holiness. The Holy Spirit is called God, Lord, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of Jehovah, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of Jesus, and the Comforter and Advocate, or Paraclete, for believers. We find out that the Holy Spirit was fully active in the beginning with the Father and the Son. And since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has in his fullness indwelt all believers, illuminating their understanding and application of God's word, as well as empowering them in their daily practical growth, their sanctification. And since the day of Pentecost, we see the work of the Holy Spirit manifest in more ways than it ever has been in the history of the world. 
We see that the Holy Spirit fills us and seals us and communes with us and fellowships with us and intercedes for us and comforts us and admonishes us, sanctifies us, enables us to resist sin and enables us to serve God. So do not think that the Holy Spirit is somehow some diminished member of the Godhead. He is fully God and is fully active, and without him, we would not be saved. So Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. In our passage today, Paul continues to speak about the benefits of salvation, the blessings of salvation. And as we have begun to look at chapter 8, we found out last week that we are free in the Spirit, but we also note that we are walking in the Spirit. We have a life in the Spirit that we are called to live as believers now, last week we said that it was the Spirit of God, the salvation of God that has freed us from the law of sin and death to walk in the Spirit of God, the law of God, and obey God. We're free in Christ. This week, as we look at our text, we'll find out how the Spirit of God changes the inward nature of humanity when they come to believe and then empowers us to obey God, to obey the law. He empowers us to have victory over the flesh in this life. So in Romans chapter, five, uh, chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. And the word says this, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, and believer, however, those who are in the church, however, he says in verse 9, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Father God, this passage of Scripture begins to show us the power of the Spirit working in us to change us from the inside out and empower us to live a life in the Spirit. To help us to understand that we are definitely called to live according to your standard and your ways, and our lives are definitely called to, to be transformed by you. But Father, it is through the Spirit that we are transformed, not through the flesh. It is through your power working in us that we are changed and empowered. And so Father, we thank you today for the Spirit of God living in us. And Father, if there's someone here that does not know you, someone here that does not have the Spirit the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in them. We pray, God, that today is the day of their salvation so they can be quickened to life, born again, and begin that journey of becoming more and more like Jesus through life in the Spirit. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this passage. Now illuminate our minds and our hearts as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
From our text today, first we see that the Holy Spirit changes our mind. The Holy Spirit changes our mind. The believer who comes to Christ is given a new nature. Now, we find out that this is going to happen even in the Old Testament. We find out that the the heart of stone will be removed and a heart of flesh will be inserted. We find out that there will be people one day who follow God, who do what God calls them to do. We find this out in the Old Testament, but then when we get to the New, we find out how this takes place. That, uh, of course, as we've looked at throughout the course of the book of Romans, there needs to be salvation. There needs to be a substitute. That everyone that has ever been born is a sinner that deserves to go to hell. But Jesus came and lived a perfect sinless life because not only is he man, but he is God. And he comes and lives a perfect sinless life and dies in our place. And because he dies in our place, when we place our faith and trust in him, he dies as our substitute. Because of this substitutionary nature of Jesus' death, then the Holy Spirit, at the time of our salvation, comes to dwell in us. Now, there are those out there that would say that the Holy Spirit does not come to dwell in us at the time of our salvation, that we somehow need to later be baptized in the Holy Ghost or something like that. But this verse of Scripture is very clear uh, in... Well, let's, let's just look at it. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to the law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Got that? Now keep going. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him, period. So when you come to Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you, period. If you do not have the Spirit, you are not saved, period. Okay? So we need to understand that. We need to understand that. So every believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so thereby, we cannot be the same person we once were. By very nature of the fact that God comes to take up residence in us. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me want to say glory. 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 The God of the universe made me righteous through the substitutionary death of Jesus so that his spirit could live in me and change me from the inside out, but I still live in a body of flesh. And as Paul said a few verses ago, who will set me free from this body of death? Well, the answer is quite simple, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has set us free from this body of death by coming to dwell in us. So by very nature of that, we are changed people. Do you know that the world would have us to believe there's all different types of people out there, and they want to divide us based on race and socioeconomic background and ethnicity and all these things. But my friend, the Bible says there's only two types of people, those who know Christ and those who don't. And that should be the only thing that really matters to us, whether a person knows Christ or not. And so there are two types of people in this world, those who believe And those who do not, those who walk according to the Spirit, and those who walk according to the flesh, those who are saved, and those who are lost. What's the difference between the two? The change, the change, the inward change. Those who walk according to the flesh, and those who walk according to the Spirit. Those who walk walk according to the flesh have a disposition toward the flesh and seek to live to please the flesh. Those who walk according to the Spirit have a disposition toward the Spirit and seek to please the Spirit. And a word of caution from Romans chapter 7 when Paul says, I don't do the things I want to do and I do do the things I don't want to do. Just because you have an inward chain doesn't mean that you do the right thing every time. And if you're married, you know that's true of your spouse. Right? Or if you're engaged. 
We've got some folks in here that are engaged. Just want to make sure y'all are ready for this. It's going to be shocking that that sweet little person you're engaged to could be so mean one day. Not that I speak from personal experience. But there is a change that takes place in the life of a believer that puts us in a disposition toward the things of the world. The desire for the things the world has to offer are the things that placate the flesh. Materialism, sexual immorality, chemical abuse, are simply living in a way that is rebellion against God, seeking to do what we want to do instead of what God is calling us to do. Those who walk according to the Spirit are those that have a disposition toward doing God's will or walking according to the ways of God. They set their minds on the Spirit. So there's a change of mind. The mind is no longer focused on the things of this world, although the things of this world sometimes distract. The mind is set on the things of the Spirit. We want to do what God has called us to do. And so the focus of spiritual things like God's will for our lives, God's word, we focus on God's word, God's character so that we can help uh, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit working in us to get our character to line up more and more with God's character. Jonathan Edwards used to say that believers have holy affections, holy affections. Uh, deep longings is what he defined this as. Uh, deep longings after God and after becoming more like God. And so our greatest satisfaction as believers is when we focus on God with these deep affections and seek to live for God and to, to make our lives look like the character of God. And then we are most satisfied, John Piper goes on to say, of Jonathan Edwards' teaching, that we are most satisfied when we are doing what God has called us to do, living for God. And so we think the things of the world will satisfy. And we think the things of the world are going to be the things that give us the most fulfillment. But my friend, it is the things of God that give us as believers the most fulfillment. And it is the things of God that lost people are really searching for in all the things that they are seeking to fill that void they have in their inward life. The lost person is unable to respond to these spiritual things. Why? Well, because we find out that the lost person is a corpse. They are spiritually dead. So dead people don't respond. You know, when, a, when an ambulance rolls up on the scene and someone's unresponsive, it's a cause for concern, right? Because they may be dying or they may be dead, right? So... The person who is spiritually dead is unresponsive because they're dead. They need to be made alive through the power of the Spirit. And so the lost person is not able to respond to the things of God. And these verses go on to teach about how the flesh is wrapped up in the idea of depravity. Now, we talked about the idea of depravity as we moved through this when we talked about all people being lost. And we talked about the idea of complete or radical depravity or total depravity. This is simply the idea that, that we're, we're depraved in every part of our being in our lost state. He, he talks about it. Uh, the flesh is weak. Uh, the flesh uh, is... Uh, hold on. Let me just read through this. My, mindset on flesh is hostile to God. Does not submit to the law, for it cannot submit. So there, all these things that it says about the flesh go on to show what he's already talked about in depravity. But what he's really focusing on here is not really the depravity that he's, he's already talked about. He's reminding you of it. What he's focusing on here is the dramatic transformation of those who have the Spirit living in them. The dramatic transformation of those who believe. So why are they hostile toward God? Because they do their own thing. They go their own way. Someone tries to tell them what the right way is, and they are resistant to it. They are hostile to it. And really, if we look out at the culture today, we would say that the culture is resistant to the things of God. Right? Why? Because their mind is set on the things of the flesh. Now, I've said it once. I'll say it a hundred more times. Lost people act like lost people because they're lost. And further, lost people act like lost people because they're dead spiritually. 
And so why do we expect lost people to share our moral values? What we really need to do is tell them about Jesus, see them saved, and then they'll come to share our moral values. Why? Because God is working in them. So really what we need to do is not argue with the lost. Have a conversation with them. Debate the lost uh, in a loving way. But love the lost and share Christ with them. That's what we need to do. By the way, how do we get our country back to God? How do we see revival in our land? One soul at a time. One soul at a time. Because when people begin to get saved in this country, and then more people begin to get saved, and more people begin to get saved, eventually everybody will put their face on the ground and come back to God. So if there's one thing I would request that you pray for above all else is that we'll see revival in this land. Because what we need is Jesus, period. I really toyed with splitting this passage of Scripture up into about three sermons. But y'all are getting the fast Cliff Notes version. Are y'all okay with that, though? All right, buckle up. Here we go. So, the mindset on the Spirit does understand spiritual things because these spiritual things lead to life and the Holy Spirit helps us to understand. But we must never forget that we too were once enemies of God. But now we have peace with God because we have a new nature. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence inside of our hearts, inside of our lives, and is helping us to live for God. And this is really summed up in verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What's he saying there? Yeah, yeah, I've already told you that we are uh, bound by a body of flesh. Who will set me free from this body of flesh? I have a new nature living in me, but we understand that the power of the Holy Spirit is that which has power over the flesh. So you want to deal with the flesh? Do it in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Have life in the Spirit. You know, one of the great things to think about at Easter time, and I know we're past Easter, but that's okay. One of the great things to think about at Easter time is when we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power it takes God to raise a dead man to life physically. That same power is alive in us because we were dead spiritually and now have been made alive. And one day our physical bodies will be resurrected and, uh, you know, we won't have back pain or knee pain or any other pain. All right? And as you get older, that amen will get louder. I appreciate people that invent amazing things, but whoever invented stairs just wasn't thinking. All right. But whoever invented the elevator, they were thinking now. I was thinking, right? The Holy Spirit raises us from the dead. The Holy Spirit changes our minds. Secondly, the Holy Spirit leads us to life. So the Holy Spirit changes our mind. The Holy Spirit leads us to life. <clears throat> Look at verse 12 and 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so the Holy Spirit leads us to life. In these verses, Paul turns his attention to the fact that the believer has a responsibility to eliminate sin from their lives by the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Throughout Scripture, we see God gives commands and then he provides a way to fulfill the command. All right? So he says to Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, always, I'm always reminded of that song, Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. Y'all heard that one before? Anyway, we used to sing that in high school. Um, God gave Joshua a command and told him he was going to take the city, and then he told him how to do it. 
you know, march around the city every day, and then on the last day, march around a bunch of times, then blow the horns and shout, and the walls came and tumbling down, right? Um, so it's interesting that God gives us a command that in and of ourselves we can't keep, and then he empowers us to keep it, gives us the ability to keep it, you know? Throughout Scripture, we see God doing this. God commands us to become like his son. And left to ourselves, we'd be going like, what? What? How? But then he gives us the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task, empowering us, enabling us. And so Paul says we are no longer obligated by the flesh to live according to the flesh, but we've been made alive in the Spirit to live according to the Spirit. Scottish theologian David Brown wrote this, if you don't kill sin, sin will kill you. Jesus says, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you than the parts of your body of your uh, perish than for your whole body to go to hell in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. Do you know that no price is too great to turn from sin? We must recognize that if a professing Christian habitually lives in sin and has no concern and shows no concern and has no heart within him or her to overcome that sin, he proves that his claims in Christ are invalid. It's not enough to live a clean and moral life. Many in churches today seek to live a self-righteous life. No, it's about a heart change that starts on the inside and affects the behavior on the outside. If you're doing good works to make your church people love you, that's not a righteous life. Why should we serve the Lord? Why should we seek to eradicate sin from our lives? Because we want to be like Christ, period. It should not surprise us that the world advocates self-love above love for God, self-fulfillment more than fulfilling God's purpose for your life, it's not a surprise that the world advocates free sexual promiscuity. The world advocates disrespect and brutality and perversion. The world uplifts the murder, those stealing many times. And, and we wonder why we have such a sense of hopelessness in our world today, why the suicide rate is skyrocketing. We wonder that. But it's because we don't have hope. We don't have hope in Christ. The goal for holy living is not to gratify self. The goal for holy living is to glorify God. Let me say that again. The goal for godly living is not to gratify yourself to have a more fulfilled life. The goal for godly living is to glorify God, and in that, you will be fulfilled. And you say, how? I'm glad you asked. For you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 1.8. The Holy Spirit is the power to help us to glorify God in these lives. Because our minds are changed and set on the things of the Spirit, we must live our lives in the Spirit. Our minds are changed, and then by the same token, so should our behavior be changed. But how? How do we live in the Spirit? 
Well, we must live our life in the Spirit, number three. How? First, we must recognize the presence of sin in our lives. We must recognize the presence of sin in our lives. You can't recognize the presence of sin in your lives if, if you don't read God's Word and understand it. So when you first come to Christ and you know that, you know, foul language is wrong and, you know, drug abuse is wrong and murder is wrong and stealing is wrong, those aren't too difficult in most cases to overcome. Uh, a drug addict may have a period of time that takes them to overcome that. I don't want to diminish their plight, but certainly these things we understand immediately. But what about when we're a Christian for a while and all of a sudden we be it begins to dawn on us that gossiping is a sin? Now, wait a minute. I'm just using an example. I could have said lust. But, but it begins to dawn on us that gossiping is a sin. It doesn't mean we weren't a gossip from the beginning. It just means the Holy Spirit is working on us, showing us what God wants for us. And then we begin to deal with the gossip in our lives or the lust in our lives, see? And so it, it is God who helps us to understand what sin is. And sadly... Many in churches today focus on the big sins and they forget about the things like gossip and judgmentalness and all that. But as we grow more in Christ, we'll begin to understand the presence of sin in our lives. Sin is powerful and if left unchecked, it can be destructive to our witness and to our lives. Next, we have to have a heart fixed on God. So we've we got to recognize the presence of sin, but we also got to have a heart fixed on God. That is, that, that the very focus of our lives is about God. You know, not about a nicer house, not about, you know, even putting food on the table. I mean, we certainly need to care about those things. But the main focus of our lives is on the things of God, right? So we have to fix our mind on the things of God. Secondly, or thirdly, uh, I can count, by the way. Thirdly, we should meditate on God's Word. By the way, where do we find all the information we need that is sufficient for this life that we live to come to Christ and stay with Christ? In the Word of God. So the Word of God is supremely important. Those who are out there within the framework of Christianity that are making the fiercest, fiercest attacks against traditional Christian doctrine are doing so in relation to devaluing the sufficiency of Scripture and the authority of Scripture. This is God's Word. This is the only place that you can come to know who God is and what He expects for your life. You can't go sit out on a mountain and God reveal these things to you. You need to go sit out on a mountain with the Word of God and He'll reveal some things to you. So the Word of God is important. So we need to put our face and our hearts in the Word of God. You want to know who God is? You want to know how we should live? Then we put our faces in the Word of God. So thirdly, we need to fix our eyes on God and meditate in His Word. Fourthly, we must commune with God. Now, I don't want to diminish prayer. Prayer is vitally important, but prayer should be based on the Word of God. But prayer should be an intentional Regular communion with God. The, the idea from Scripture is to pray without ceasing, right? That doesn't mean that we pray every moment of the time that we're awake. What it means is that we're in a continual attitude of prayer where as we're walking through life, at any moment we can say, Lord, help me with this. Uh, Lord, strengthen me for this. Lord, help me in my thoughts. So we commune with God through prayer. Salvation is about a relationship with God. And so certainly, those who are in a relationship want to talk sometimes, right? If you don't communicate well, hey, married couples, let these, these newly engaged couples know. You, you got to talk to each other, right? You got to communicate with each other. So we commune with God in a relationship. And lastly, we practice obedience by allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. 
There's a passage of Scripture that says, Do not be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, a lot of people have taken that to be predominantly a verse on not getting drunk. And so let me just issue a disclaimer. Don't get drunk. Okay, but that verse is about walking in the Spirit. He goes on to talk about walking in the Spirit. So what he's saying there is that when you're drunk with wine, you allow a substance to enter your body and impair it or control it. As Christians... We should not be drunk with wine. Instead, we should be filled with the Spirit in the same way that you become drunk with wine, that it is a, a, an outward influence on the body that comes to dwell in us, that causes us and controls us toward the things of God. Does that make sense? Y'all tracking with me on that? All right. So, we practice obedience by allowing the Holy Spirit to control us as we walk in the things of God. And this just calls for us to build a habit of walking with the Spirit. So I guess if I really had to sum up this sermon in one sentence, it would be just this. We need to be Spirit-filled believers of God. That is how we walk in the Spirit. And so whenever you're teaching a children's or youth Sunday school class and you ask, you know, the question, how do you live a more fulfilled Christian life? The, what do they say? They say, read your Bible, pray, focus on God, maybe. And probably some of them say Jesus, because that's always the right answer, right? Pretty simple. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit dwells in you. So this morning, I would like to just ask you a simple question. Are you walking in the flesh, or are you walking in the Spirit? Do you have a personal relationship with the King of the universe through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or are you just playing games with religion? Are you saved and living a life that reflects your spiritual relationship with God? Or are you living a life that reflects maybe a religious experience without a religious salvation? If you have never surrendered your life to Christ, then we need to bow our knees before the Lord today, and you need to be saved. If you're here today, and you are a believer... Perhaps you've been allowing the flesh to control you. I call on you to repent today and walk in the Spirit. For God has given us a beautiful life of abundance and great blessing if we will only walk in the Spirit. Walk no longer according to the flesh and the ways of this world, but walk according to the Spirit. Because life in the Spirit is what we will be living for all eternity. And this life for the believer is about practice for eternity, right? So we better get to practicing, right? Let's pray. Father, we come before you today so thankful for the opportunity to join together in a time of invitation. And Father, if there's someone that does not know you as Savior, we pray that today they can be saved, that they will submit themselves to you, admit that they're a sinner, believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and confess that to us this morning. And the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that person will then be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and begin to walk with you. For those of us who are believers, we pray, God, that you will help us to place our face on the ground and repent from walking according to the flesh and live our lives as spiritual beings walking in the Spirit with our minds set on the things of the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to get our minds off the flesh and to live for you. And Father, for any other decisions that need to be made this morning or any others that are going through difficult times, I pray that you'll be with them as we have this time of invitation. Father, use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our time of invitation. Stand with us. This altar is open if you'd like to come and pray. Not only is this altar open, but I'd love to pray with you. 
If you would love to be saved, come and talk to me. Any other decision you'd have to make, I'd love to talk to you. Let's sing together. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted. Maybe seated for just a moment. Uh, Y'all come on up. All right. All right. We have come in here today to join the church by letter from Baptist Tabernacle Church in LaGrange, Georgia. Uh, Bill and Karen Finneran. Bill and Karen Finneran. <clears throat> and. Um, they live on my street, so I will keep an eye on them, and apparently they're your spy to keep an eye on me. All right, so we are glad that they moved into the area, and we are grateful that they've come to join the church by letter. If you're happy to have them, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, stand with us, and uh, it, it would do you well to get to know these guys. They've got an interesting story, uh, so, so have some lunch with them sometime and have fun. Uh, and they got some pretty interesting stories, too, yeah, yeah, especially Ron. He's got an interesting story. But anyway, we are glad to be here in the house of the Lord together. You come by and say hello to them and welcome them to our church, uh, uh, and, and uh, we're grateful that we're here. Let's close with a song. Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah.